In the 1800s, the cold domesticity was enshrined upon women, the homemakers, glorifying their duties and moral power. The cold domesticity can be understood through four main pillars, piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. Women were considered to be a purifying force on men, bringing them back to God when they strayed from religion. They are described as the moral sex and were expected to study religion only. In the ladies' repository, it states, Religion is exactly what a woman needs, for it gives her that dignity that best suits her dependence. However, the reasoning behind promoting piety in women is more than just a bl the belief that they were the religious sex. Religion was actually an oppressive force on women, as it acted as a tranquilizer to any longings they had in an attempt to keep them praying instead of thinking. If they were to engage in their longings, such as movements and or participation in other areas, it would threaten the rigid values and responsibilities women were expected to assume. Religion could be studied in the home, keeping women in their proper sphere, their house. Furthermore, religion promoted the duties expected of a woman, reinforcing the ideas of submission and domesticity. Any attempt to pursue non-religious knowledge was said to intervene in a woman's domestic duties, so women were restricted to the Bible for their intellectual pursuits. The second pillar, purity, is closely linked to piety. Men were presumed to naturally sin, and women would be expected to maintain their virtue as men attempted to tarnish it. Furthermore, a woman's delicacy was seen as the only influence she had over men. It was a supposed source of power. Without purity, she was unworthy of the company of men. In the excellency of the female character vindicated, Thomas Brannigan warns that if a woman allowed a man to take her purity, she will be left in silent sadness to bewail her credulity, imbecility, duplicity, and premature prostitution. In the event of a woman losing her innocence, she was no longer seen as a woman, but someone of a lower class or order. A clear representation of the consequences of loss of purity is shown through a dried white rose, which symbolized death preferable to loss of innocence. The third pillar is submissiveness, a lesson that was forced upon women. In the recollection of a southern matron, the author describes the domestic happiness that is achieved by women confessing to fault and stopping their self-defense, whether they were in the right or not, in gentle submission. Any intellectual pursuits or talents were submerged for her husband in order to work entirely for him. As Grace Greenwood wrote, the feminine genius is ever timid, doubtful, and clingingly dependent, a perpetual childhood. Female ambition was, of course, backed up by religion, as stated in the Ladies' Repository, which wrote that man was superior by God's appointment, if not an intellectual dowry, at least by official decree. Therefore, to interfere with the submissive quality of woman was to interfere with the order of the universe. Any woman who dared to try to defy social construct that she was forced into was immediately chastised and ridiculed by society, such as Fanny Wright was an early feminist. She was described to be godless, and one man wrote of her saying she was no woman, mother though she be. A key component of the clothed domesticity was, of course, domesticity. In Domestic and Social Claims on Women, it states, St. Paul knew what was best for women when he advised them to be domestic. It affords security not only from the world, but from the delusions and errors of every kind. Another threat besides the outside world was books. Women of the time greatly enjoyed reading novels, but were told that they interfered with her religious study. However, many women's magazines would write about housekeeping, promising the husband that he would find his wife no less assiduous for his reception or less sincere in welcoming his return. Books that attacked a woman's place in society were regarded as dangerous, or could unsettle them and send the world into confusion. Therefore, any literature that could have influenced women to demand rights or freedom or anything that threatened the cult of domesticity was kept away from one, women whenever possible. Using the values that make up the cult of domesticity, women's magazines and other literature attempted to convince women that they had both power and virtue at home. However, as time wore on, more women would no longer see the glorified cult of domesticity as a sanctuary, but rather an ornately disguised cage.